So welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Terry Belcourt. I'm the Director of Nursing Practice here at the SRNA. And I'm here to help facilitate this webinar along with Tony Geruzzi, who is our IT support. Um, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that this presentation is being held on Aboriginal land and recognize the strength, resilience, and capacity of the Treaty 4 and Métis people in this land. Our topic today is PJ paralysis, and I'm so thrilled to have Joanne Peterson and Curtis um, off-site, so he's going to be presenting as well. Uh, and we have a video message from uh, Brian no Dolan, who is the originator of this project, this way of being. So we're going to start with a video message from Brian. Hello, my name is uh, Professor Brian Dolan and I'm the originator of the End PJ Paralysis uh, Social Movement. And I'm going to speak to you for the next couple of minutes around that, about where it came from, why it's important, and also talk to you about uh, a global social summit, uh, um, the online summit that we held back on the 10th to 12th of July which you can access yourself on npjparalysis.org um, because I'm particularly pleased to be speaking to you at that invitation of Joanne and also Curtis, a, a highly regarded, respected uh, Saskatchewan uh, nurse and physiotherapist, both of whom presented at our uh, summit. So why NPJ Paralysis? Where did it come from? Why does it matter? Well, um, it was actually born right now uh, behind me. I'm actually in Christchurch in New Zealand where I work for about six months a year. I spend about five months a year in the UK and I'll spend about a month or so in Australia working. And I'm a visiting professor of nursing at the Oxford Institute for Nursing, Midwifery and Allied Health Research. My day job, if you like, is I'm a director of Allied, of, sorry, director of uh, Health Service 360 in the UK at Stratford-upon-Avon, where we work with organizations around the world in uh, the, uh, so in the space of uh, improving patient care, uh, patient safety, particularly leadership and culture change at that whole system level. But I'm also a visiting professor or honorary professor indeed of leadership in healthcare at the University of Salford near Manchester. So my, my, my clinical background is in both mental health and in ED, emergency nursing. And uh, the actual NPJ paralysis campaign, in fact, was really born out of thinking through how do we value patients' time? And in fact, it's not money that connects health systems, it's, it's time. Because when you unpick it, you know, the connecting currency is time because what are waiting lists measured in? They're measured in time. Uh, harm is frequently caused as a consequence of time ill spent. The longer you wait in the emergency department, the more harm that will befall you. And there's some great Australian work undertaken by Drew Richardson in 2006, where he found a 40% increase in morbidity and mortality at one week for patients with a protracted wait in emergency departments. And I know in some of the Canadian EDs, your waiting times are, are significant as well. In fact, I was in Calgary, brilliant uh, Calgary, uh, last year, my first trip to um, Canada and immediately fell in love with the place. Um, what else is there? They're waiting for, waiting for patients for them when they want to go home. You know, they're waiting for discharge letters, they're waiting for medications, they're waiting for the surprise relative who didn't know they're going home that day. They're running around looking for stuff, you know, there you are at work looking for an OBS machine and suddenly you find two of them huddled together like survivors of the Titanic. And what have you done? You have wasted time. And in fact, 70% of the global health system's funding is spent on time. Because most of what we spend in the health budgets is on salaries and wages, and whether you are part-time or full-time, what salaries and wages represent is the purchase of the things that's most precious to all of us, which is time. And let me ask you a question which I'd like you to answer yourself, which is this. If you had a thousand days left to live, how many would you choose to spend in hospital? Now I suspect, like me, the answer would be none at all, be zero. Because actually, as kind as we are, for the public, where they want to spend their time is with their own loved ones, for the vast majority of people. So, in fact, valuing their time in is the patient's time is the most important currency in, in healthcare. And I would argue that while our time is busy and important, our patient's time is sacred. 
and it's how do we value that. And NPJ paralysis is a vehicle to do so. And in fact, it was born, despite what is often said, in fact, it was born in another great big country, but this time it was Australia. And it was born in the outback in New South Wales in a little township called Broken Hill, uh, a, a hospital of a population of about, I don't know, it's about 18,000 people there. It's a hospital of about, of two wards, it's about 50 beds all up, I think. And it was, came from a conversation I was having with a nurse manager who ran a subacute rehab unit, Sarug as they called it there. And she was talking about how they encourage people, you know, to start mobilizing. And uh, the physio assistant said, oh, you know, is it, when I take them off to the gym, the physio gym is, okay, instead of them being in the slippers and gown, can they just at least get their shoes on instead of me taking them with their shoes and put them on? And from there, it's, it's, uh, this patient thought, well, if I'm putting my shoes on, I may as well just get my clothes on. And what they found actually is started to change behavior. Because when you think about it, clothes, pajamas and gowns, they make you feel like you are unwell. Whereas clothes make you feel like you're better. And there is a real evidence of cognitive shift that occurs to us as individuals if we are, um, if we're not feeling well and we get dressed. But if you think about our patients, you know, they, they're feeling uh, they've been in their PJs. Because uh, does, where does the language come from? Well, it's because people come into hospital, they get in their pajamas, and then they're paralyzed in their pajamas till the day they leave. So let's end PJ paralysis. But what happens is people are getting dressed, they're getting up, they're moving, and they're starting to feel better about themselves. Their family, their relatives come in and say, oh my gosh, ma'am, you look great today. You look terrible. They say, now look at you, you're looking brilliant. The patient thinks, yeah, I'm good. But what we also have discovered is that registrars, for example, you know, middle, middle to senior grade doctors, were discharging patients sooner because they thought, actually, rather than waiting through the weekend, why don't you go home rather than seeing you on Monday? And that was a shift. And this is the thing, it's all down to the avoidance of something called deconditioning. And deconditioning is a systemic, multi-system decline of physical and um, even social function. Because while deconditioning uh, affects all ages, in fact it can affect uh, its impact is significant the older you get. So if you get to the age of 80 and you spend one week in a hospital bed, you will lose 20% of quads power, the stuff that keeps you standing. You will lose 10% of your aerobic capacity, which is about your general fitness. And you can lose that at a rate of about one to 2% a day, but you would also can lose up to one and a half kilos of muscle mass. It, um, and in fact, there's no body system which it doesn't, the deconditioning doesn't affect. You know, people who stay on bed rest, their peristalsis slows down, leading to constipation. They're not eating enough because they don't, if you're not burning calories, you're not going to be hungry. And of course, people who've had surgery need a higher protein load. Uh, I do wonder, in fact, how many, um, how many wounds are, you know, infections are indirectly co a consequence of malnutrition. Um, you know, pressure sores, you know, skin integrity is compromised and also even with mental well-being. People just feel miserable, so they do, when they're feeling, on, you know, when they're stuck in bed. So getting people up, dressed and moving shifts people's sense of themselves, it gives them a sense of agency, it shifts the health professional's view of them. But here's the other thing. We ran a major campaign in the UK across the National Health Service, the NHS, last year from April to June, across 70 days to represent 70 days of the NHS's founding back in 1948. This was last year. And in that time, there was 700,000 patients who got up and got dressed and got moving. So a significant impact. And in one 2,000 bedded health system, the Northern Care Alliance, which covers uh, North Manchester, Salford, Bury, Oldham, and a place that's good name escapes me right now. Oldham, I think if I haven't already mentioned it. What they found was, in fact, they saw a 27, that and a, and a couple of other things, you know, bundle in, hello, my name is, what matters to me, you, you know, things around that. And what they found is they saw a 27% reduction in falls. Because if you're mobilizing, you're maintaining muscle mass, and actually you're going to, you know, there's less risk of demineralization of bone, there's all of that strength and conditioning that goes on in day-to-day -day activities, which is not lost. So they saw a 27% reduction in falls a 67% reduction in pressure sores, because if you're not on your back, you're not gonna get a pressure sore. In fact, the only part of our body physiologically designed to maintain, uh, to, to withstand pressure is the soles of our feet. And 
crucially, a 1.8 day reduction in length of stay. And we did it through an app, which you can, you know, you'll be able to find if you get in touch with you. My uh, Twitter handle is Brian W. Dolan, or you can email me at brian at ntjparalysis.org if you wish. So we had an app, and because measures drive behavior, and that actually impacted on how people started to do stuff. And it really made a difference. Right now we're doing it in uh, Melbourne, in Western Melbourne, and they themselves are seeing a significant reduction in falls and pressure sores because they're measuring it. And that's just great to see. And it's enabling patients, it's enabling staff, it's more fun. And then we had this slightly wild idea because Twitter is great for creating that sort of space where people can have conversations to have a global summit. And that's what we did. And Curtis and Joanne spoke, they were fantastic. And I have to play an absolute tribute as well to Paul Wright, Israel Henderson, G Jennifer Simon, and a, and a number of others in Alberta, because they got it going in Canada. In Alberta, they, I, would be, I spoke at Foothills last April 2018, and they loved the idea, and they took it up and ran with it, and they have been sensational. What I love has been their spirit of generosity. They've been really supportive of Saskatchewan. I know Paul, for example, will have spoken to a number of folk in Saskatchewan, and they've been generous with what they have. And we do have a Facebook page. If you just look up NPJ Paralysis on Facebook, you'll find a load of downloadable content, which we are very, very happy to share with you. So npjprices.org is the website if you want to go and see all of our presentations and Paul has, and, and Isabel have spoken on that as well. I've presented uh, Linda Holt, the CEO of NHS of uh, Health Service 360 even, uh, done some fantastic presentations on uh, the stories we tell. And there's some you know, stuff around deconditioning, social movement, um, what, you know, the physiology of it, a number of, a number of papers from from uh, Peter Rolick uh, at ED Doc uh, presented as well and on the apps that have been done and this kind of change that can happen. So this is a really exciting opportunity, an exciting time to be part of something that's bigger than, than ourselves. And here's an important thing to stress. I'm a nurse, I'm really, really proud of that. I'm over 30 years in our profession and every day I'm, I'm proud to be a nurse. And you know, let nobody ever tell you that, oh, I'm just a, because actually, I grew up in the west of Ireland. Um, life wasn't, you know, it, it had its own challenges when you're growing up there. And just because you have not started your life on the front foot doesn't mean you can't make a difference. Just because life hasn't, you know, said, here you go, it's all there late looking for you, doesn't mean you can't make a change. Just because you're a nurse or a doctor or a, a, a therapist, there's no juster. What it's about is a belief that we can make a difference. Because in the end, the purpose and the, the behind NPJ paralysis is about valuing people's time as the most important currency in healthcare. About a purpose that drives us to make it better for patients. And in, when, when it works for patients, it always works for staff. And it's also about outrage that people suffer needlessly when they don't need to because we give them back their time, that most precious thing. But we give them back an opportunity for a life beyond the hospital setting. And it could play as far as anywhere in the community hospitals, in care homes, in people's own homes, and having a conversation where we're changing the conversation in healthcare to encourage people to take their own agency, their own opportunities to control the things they can control. And we do that by starting a conversation that might go along the lines of, why don't you get up and get dressed today? And while it won't work for everyone, and you know, it's not saying everyone should for clinical or other reasons, it's about giving people a choice. And I know this, if I was in my last thousand days, and none of us knows when our last thousand days will begin, what I'd want to know is the people who took care for me didn't just care for me, they cared about me. They pushed me, but even when I didn't want to be, because they made me get up, get dressed, get moving, because they knew I would get back to the ones I love the most sooner. And what's better than that to know you got home and somebody else got home to people we will never meet, to be with them in what may be their last thousand days, and even if it isn't, it's more days with the ones they care about. And in a great, great province like Saskatchewan, that's about making a difference to everyday lives of Canadians and the many people 
you bring into that great country of yours, your, your tolerance, your compassion, your decency, your, the, the way you reach out to people in Canada, you're a model for, for greatness in the world in a, in a time of challenge. You, are, you, offer, you represent the decency that is a, lot, a great country that Canada gives. And at a time like these, we need that. So thank you for all you do. Thank you for the difference you make. And thank you, Joanne and Curtis, for the opportunity to speak to this great nursing body. And go well on the next part. And I'm going to pass you on to Joanne and Curtis now. They'll take it from there. Take care for now. OK, can uh, you see my slide there, Joanne? Absolutely, Curtis. And here okay. you are. Perfect. Um, I guess, uh, so I, my name is Curtis Newton. I'm a physiotherapist with uh, Saskatchewan Health Authority. I work in Swift Current as well as today. I'm actually out at the Herbert Integrated Facility um, at, at their hospital. I kind of travel around a little bit. As, uh, so I'm a, a point of care physio. Uh, I treat inpatients, outpatients uh, here in Herbert, long-term care, home visits. So kind of in southwestern Saskatchewan, physiotherapists, uh, we we kind of roam all over the place. So um, I have to say it's quite an honor to, uh, to speak to you guys. Uh, my, my mom is a, a recently retired nurse. She was a nurse for 35 years in Swift Current and um, definitely had an impact in, in terms of how I got in, involved in healthcare. So um, I, it's, it's truly an honor to talk to the uh, SNRA today. So, um, and also an honor to be, you know, it's, talking after somebody uh, like Brian Dolan who is just so passionate about healthcare and 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 changing the culture of healthcare and and passionate about patient care and and so I, I think it's uh, he's definitely an inspiration to me and and I um, look forward to keeping that uh, keeping his uh, ideas alive here for sure so um, my project uh, in Swift Current is get up get dressed get moving changing the culture of acute care from gowns and rest to clothing and mobility. So I, I'd followed the um, uh, kind of program through the clinical quality improvement program in uh, through the health quality council. Um, and uh, so the, the, this program is designed to look at clinical quality improvement within the, your healthcare setting. Um, I, it was mostly physicians that were involved in the program, but other healthcare providers, including uh, nurses, can apply to this program. And I would encourage you guys, if you're interested in quality improvement, by all means, uh, you know, think of a project and apply to this program. It's every year runs through, they have a different cohort. They're running through cohort four right now. Um, so, but it, it's such a, such a good program and definitely, uh, really gave me the confidence to think about as as a point of care staff member in Swift Current that I can make a difference in patient care and you don't have to be a manager or, a, or a, a administrator to make a difference. So uh, my inspiration for this project uh, was essentially came from Twitter. Um, so Dr. Jenny Bazern who's a, a geriatrician in Saskatoon um, and her uh, the the discussion that she was having about ending PJ paralysis uh, that Brian Dolan had started in the UK. Um, Paul Wright, uh, who is from the group in Alberta that Brian talked about, that has been really, really helpful in, in guiding me through this process and, and being really generous with his time and, and information. Um, and then a couple really uh, kind of striking research articles that I, I read uh, one was from the Move Ontario project or Move Canada. Uh, when, and what they found is that when they increased mobility uh, by 10%, so just 10% just of the increase in people's mobility while they're admitted, reduced their length of stay by up to six days, which is a huge, huge number. Um, and then the other article was called What Happened to My Legs When I Broke My Arm, Juliet Harvey. And, and what she found is that... Um, even this this certain person, they were admitted to the hospital and they were wearing a pedometer. And uh, what they found is uh, they were part of this activity study, and then they fell and broke their their arm. And so they kept monitoring through them through the hospital stay. And in a three day hospital stay, you can see um, such a, a big jump uh, in amount of daily sitting time. And even at four weeks post discharge, is this is a huge one. Is that three days in hospital where you're not 
where you're sitting, not moving around, uh, has an impact uh, that where their baseline activity level still hasn't reached back to normal at a month post discharge, and and their legs were fine. Right? They they broke their arm. So uh, we, you know, lots of times in hospital, I find in this first day or two during the admission, somebody's acute or painful, uh, that we kind of let them off the hook. You know, that you know, okay, it's okay, they can stay in bed. Um, but I think it's it's so important that you know that we get people moving right away once they're admitted because there's such an impact even after three days or two days in hospital that can be such a, a lasting uh, impact where it's longer than than a month and they're still not walking around as much and you think about somebody and this is person that's involved in a activity study somebody who's frail that impact is even greater so maybe they're a high risk to fall while in the hospital and and we're um you know call don't fall or using bed alarms and and then they don't fall where they're in the hospital but we're definitely setting them up to be a high risk to fall when they go home so um just definitely pushing the the mobility factor so um my goal in my project was to increase uh, independent mobility on units one and two from 66 percent in 56% by 10%. So in sort of in uh, conjunction with that Move Ontario study. Um, so we decided to do ending PJ paralysis. Um, we use po bathroom and posters and information pamphlets. Um, we use full size posters of leaders in, in our community to, to give it information and education to families and and also the care providers uh, we started a clothing hamper which was something that uh, is kind of inspired through joanne um, and that's up and running in our hospital now and uh, the other things that we're starting to move on to and i'll talk about later is just progressing that into more structured mobility intervention at the Move Ontario uh, and the everybody moves at johns hopkins uh, we want to start a walking track um, and our hospital with uh, points of interest to get people out of their rooms and also possibly coffee row. So our NPJ paralysis, uh, we took baseline data collection from uh, November 1st, 2018 to March 9th, 2019. This was on units one and two, uh, the med surge units in Swift Current at Cypress Regional Hospital. Our nursing unit coordinator, uh, Nicole Vance, uh, she was part of our team, and she rounded with the patients as, uh, with the CCAs on the floors every day and encouraged um, or at, and took the baseline data. This data was put into REDCAP data collection system, and posters were placed in all the rooms and large posters in the hallways. Um, patients were once the study or once the project started, they were encouraged to wear clothes. Um, so our baseline, basically, our number, our median value was zero of people. People just weren't wearing clothes uh, in our baseline numbers. So three percent on units one and five percent on units two were wearing their own clothing. Uh, the amount of people up and moving independently were seventy percent on units one and sixty-five percent on unit two. So one of the things we, before we kicked off our project was to have this, uh, and this is again inspired by Paul uh, Wright in Alberta, was to have this tri-storming session where you bring together, you know, um, frontline staff, uh, patient and family representatives, leadership, administration, uh, content experts, and everybody comes together in a room and figures out, okay, what, what do we want to work on here and what's going to be what we looked at were tailwinds, so things that are helping you along, headwinds, uh, things that are sort of restricting you, and what can you do to break that wind, so the, the windbreakers to, to help you through your, the problems. So this, you can see how much uh, information sharing happened at this meeting. I thought it was just a great way when you have team members uh, in, in the same room as the patient and family representatives and, and uh, leadership, um, I think it's really inspiring, especially talking to patients um, and their families about uh, how how they perceive care. I think it's it it really uh, engages the staff members to be a part of the the project. So, and this is just a a nice version of the same the same slide. So, what we found is that we thought you know things that are helping us along is things like quality of life, mobility is contagious. You know, you see people moving and exercising, you move and exercise. We want to prevent 
um, you know, iatrogenic complications in the hospital. Um, families want to take ownership in, in patient care. We heard that from the patient and family rep. Sometimes they, uh, they just don't know how to do it. So with ending PJ paralysis, you know, it's an opportunity for families to help out by bringing in clothing or helping somebody walk. Um, and it was also, we saw this as part of connected care. So um, the headwinds we saw and, and I talked about is that it seems like more work. Anything that, you know, especially for staff on, on med surge floors, anything that seems to be adding to your workload that's already full um, is less likely to happen. Um, we found patients, the headwinds patients don't realize the benefits of getting up. You know, they have that sick role. They feel they want, you know, staying in bed. This, the culture of resting when you're sick. Um, we thought the flow continuing the philosophy into home is also a problem. Um, we see this all the time where people, we see them moving in the hospital and once they go home, they stay in bed and they don't move and they end up back for something else. And that's some of the research is showing that if somebody's admitted with um, a, an acute exacerbation of COPD, for example, um, with, if they are readmitted uh, within a month, lots of times it's not even for the same diagnosis. It's, you know, they go home and they stay in bed and, and they become dehydrated. Um, stubborn patients and this is something that we found even once we started our project is that uh, the staff was really engaged they wanted to help uh, patients or encourage them to wear their own clothing um, but patients sometimes didn't know why so they thought well I don't want to wear my clothes and, and so this was frustrating for the for the staff that were helping um, so again this is where we came up with our ideas about uh, giving people, you know, engaging families, getting people having reasons for getting out of their rooms, um, talking about communications, walking track, um, and also don't make clothing a barrier. So that was the, when we have these stubborn patients that, you know, maybe say, oh, I, I don't want to wear my clothes out, you know, I'm just happy in this gown. Um, the important part is that they, you know, it's get up, get dressed, get moving. And the mobility, don't make clothing a barrier to getting somebody out of bed. And that was, again, our focus here. So communication was a big piece. Uh, these are the posters that I, I made. I think when your communication is huge when you're trying to get uh, uh, start a project like this. And so I had uh, Beth Vashon and Dr. Heinde Klerk um, as my models. And uh, it was... It, these posters are up. Uh, so when everybody walks into our med surge unit in Swift Current, they can see these posters and it reminds family members that, you know, gives them an idea of, of what we're doing as well as staff members see it too. And it's kind of a reminder to them to encourage patients to wear their own clothing. Um, these are examples of uh, patient room posters and staff room posters. Um, and by all means, if anybody is interested in these posters, I, I uh, am willing to share. You can email me through the SASC Health Authority um, or uh, get a hold of me on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is at PTKurt. So by all means, uh, get a hold of me and I can share these with you. So our results. So we had. Um, Basically, uh, yeah, March 11th to May 9th, we had people, we were encouraging them at all points, especially during the rounding, as well as, you know, having the posters up and, and different providers going into the rooms to say, you know, if this is why it's important to wear your own clothes. If you can get your, you know, bring your clothing in. And we saw a big jump. So about 25% more people uh, were wearing their own clothes on units one and two. Um, and, and so that, that was great. In terms of mobility, uh, so units one, we saw about a 15% jump in mobility, which is a, is a great number. And in unit, units two, we saw about a 2% jump in mobility. And unit two, because it was a short, um, you know, about six weeks of measurement, uh, the, the numbers there, we had a few uh, ALC patients as well as palliative patients on that side. And so that I think impacted the amount of, of people um, up and moving independently. So the interesting thing is that both of these seem to go up. So you have your, your patients wearing clothing goes up by 25% and it seems like mobility also went up. So you assume, you know, um, clothing helped with mobility. The interesting 
interesting thing is, is that it seemed that the, the project had an impact on units one uh, of the trial being in place, as well as a small impact on unit two. However, we did notice there was very co low correlation between the percentage of patients wearing their own clothes and the percentage of patients mobile. So that it didn't necessarily, if there was a lot of people wearing clothes one day, there might have not coincided with more people moving. So the correlation was very low. The project itself, the discussion about mobility, the discussion about wearing clothing increased both those um, variables, but the one variable did not influence the other. Um, and we also saw interesting thing enough is the uh, it appeared that there was a weak positive trend of improved mobility throughout the trial. So the whole entire observation period, um, our mobility numbers were gradually improving. And that was because we were doing things like tri-storming, um, talking to staff members about mobility, putting up more posters, um, and that was having that impact. Um, and so just talking about mobility and making it a priority um, improves mobility on your floor. So what did I learn from this project? I, I think um, the value of social media. So I, I use Twitter all the time. Uh, I find that, you know, just learning about this new research and uh, new challenges, as well as all these great ideas, connecting with people um, like Paul Wright and Brian Dolan, who just share information with you, provide you with uh, their research, provide you with posters and information. Um, it's, it's just a really quick and easy way of uh, getting information fast. And especially as a professional now, it's, you know, everybody's really busy at work. Um, it's hard to sit down and just look up research. Um, Twitter just, you can, uh, allows you to very quickly uh, attach to uh, people that you find interesting and where, um, and, and have new information every day. Um, I like data. I think data is important to, to show that what's important um, and it's proof of kind of when you're trying to do new initiatives uh, that what you're doing is useful. I found the, the value of patient and family advisors is, is really, really important. Um, the discussion I had with uh, you know, my patient and family virus really guided me along in the process. Um, the challenge that I had were communication barriers. I think having communication members on your team, in my case, the communication department didn't, wasn't able to help me with my project. And so uh, I spent a lot of time making posters and taking pictures when I, I probably should have been focused more on the intervention of the project. And, and time and staffing. We were short staffed to physiotherapists and Swift Grant at the time. And that also makes it hard to, to do projects like this. So next steps, um, we're working on the walking track in Swift Current. Um, we've actually expanded both, so all four units in Swift Current are doing ending PJ paralysis at, at this time. Um, and we just had our meeting last week where we're going to expand uh, to improve our unstructured mobility promotion as well as looking at these work standards. So uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, daily mobility calculator is what we're looking at starting in Swift Current. So this is just a way of, of having a standardized communication that's patient-centered. So if somebody, uh, when they're coming to the hospital, they're assessed and given a number, and then based on that number, that's uh, our focus on how we see them and, and, and encourage them to walk when they're in the hospital or move. If they're only able to do a two, um, which is bed activities or a dependent transfer, then making sure that they do sit up in bed three times a day, okay? Or if they come into the hospital and they're able to walk 250 feet, we shouldn't be just accept, accepting the fact that they're just sitting at the edge of the bed. Okay, so the, that's, that's what I see quite a bit in, in, in Swift Current is that somebody's admitted and is a seven, scores a seven or an eight, and we're okay that they're just getting up and sitting in the chair for the day, okay? It's, it's making sure that we're being objective in how uh, we're encouraging their mobility. So this is just another example of how we're, this is the next step in our project in Swift Current. Um, so if somebody is able to walk the halls three times a day or per help, with help, this is something they should be doing three times a day. 
um, or if uh, they can only sit up at the edge of the bed, they should be doing that three times a day. So really structuring how much we're um, uh, working with patients and getting them out of bed, and not just it being happy with the fact that they're sitting in the chair. So I'd like to acknowledge my team members, Nicole Vance, uh, Monique Proto, Anita Sagadol, Rocky Penner, Jean Sisa, Liz Racco, Crystal Corey, and Jill Stevenson, um, and the experts that, uh, obviously that I talked about before. And also I had support from the Health Quality Council and uh, the Clinical Quality Improvement Program. Thank you very much. I hope uh, I didn't go over time there. No, that's great, Curtis. And I want to thank you for um, being generous with your time. Um, when I reached out to Curtis to see if he would consider doing an interdisciplinary uh, webinar with me, there was no hesitation. When I reached out to Brian, there was no hesitation. So um, really big thanks to you guys. It's um, great uh, being in great company of these fine gentlemen. And um, so I'm going to round out the rest of the webinar. And um, you're going to hear a few similar things. So like Curtis, I got involved through Twitter. And what happened was in 2017, there was a post that caught my eye from Brian Dolan that it spoke to me as a registered nurse. I work at the point of care in Assiniboia, so small rural hospital. And the quote was, nursing was born in the church, raised in the military, and that's why we put our patients in uniforms. And I, I thought about this and thought about this, and I, I was just intrigued by it. I started following the hashtag, NPJ paralysis, get up, get dressed, get moving. And it just morphed from there. But I think one of the biggest reasons that I was intrigued is that this was something, this getting patients up, dressed, and moving, was something we were already doing in Assiniboia. So I thought, okay, this is a really aha moment for me because we're doing something that's now actually trending. And wow, like I'm excited about this. So I did re reach out to Curtis. And just like he said, I asked for some posters to put up in the rooms. He provided them very graciously started following along and then when as brian told you they decided to have a virtual global summit i thought hmm i wonder if they'd be interested in hearing what we do in assiniboia well you know what i'll just put i'll make up an abstract and, and see how it goes and i talked to curtis and he thought he might do the same thing and so in the end curtis and i were the only two presenters from saskatchewan there was a number of presenters from alberta as uh Brian talked about. Um, there was a number of presenters from John Hopkins University, the Mayo Clinic, a number of the big medical facilities in the States. And it, it really was a real privilege to be presenting along with, you know, big names like that. But I must say that when I started watching the summit, I actually really got cold feet and thought, I don't know that people want to really hear my story. I don't have a lot of data like Curtis had. I didn't even have a PowerPoint to be really honest with you. I just wanted to tell the story of what I've seen in Assiniboia. And about two and a half hours, the, the virtual summit went on half hour increments. So every half hour there was a new presenter and they went 24 hours a day because we had presenters from um, overseas we had presenters from Australia so they were able to just keep it rolling and then they'd say okay now the North American uh, group is starting you know so anyway I listened to Linda Holt and uh, you heard uh, Brian talk about her she's involved with uh, 360 in UK and she inspired me about two hours before my session and her talk was all about when you get a venue to tell your story and that's the opportunity to do it and you should be proud of that and I, I reflect back on uh, Brian's comments about you know we're about just a nurse you're not just a nurse and your story is important and so that's where I'm coming to you from so um, I'm going to just uh, very briefly go through some of the um, some of the things that uh, I shared at the virtual summit so I've only worked in Assiniboia for five years. And when I started working down there, 
it was very clear to me that they did things a little differently and they got their patients dressed. They had what I call the tickle trunk and that's what um, uh, Curtis was uh, referring to when he said that he had some inspiration for me about a closet of clothing. In Assiniboia we have that and I call it the tickle trunk. So we have a lot of donated clothing uh, from the community um, and we then, if someone doesn't have clothing or doesn't have a family member that can bring in clothing, we provide it for them. And sometimes we even send clothing home with people if we think that they need it. So I said, wow, like, you know, we're doing all these things. And um, in Assiniboia, our situation is because we're an integrated facility, we have a wing of patients that are either waiting for long-term care placement, they're transitioning, convalescing after fractured hips, and they're getting their rehab back in their home community. And what we, what, what the progression was is that that wing we encourage them to go down and have their meals in the dining room of our long-term care facility that's attached. So the seniors, they did not want to be out of their rooms in their pajamas and go and sit in the long-term care side in a dining room of people in their pajamas. That's practically a cardinal sin for these people. So um, they were, we were getting them up and dressed. And then it was just sort of a natural progression that it flowed around the corner to our acute care ward. And we started, you know, they, they just started getting people dressed. So it has become, in Assiniboia, I would say just our cultural norm. And again, I, I do want to emphasize that it is not everyone. We don't force people to get dressed. We encourage it. And I've, I've seen some really great success stories. So when it just becomes part of your ward culture, I think the other thing that I was really excited about was that this was very nursing driven in Assiniboia. This was just nurses taking their own initiative and saying, we think this is making a difference for our patients. And we didn't have anyone telling us that, you know, we need to collect statistics and things. We just were doing it because it was, it was what was, the, what was right and best for our patients. So during the, the global virtual summit, I shared five reflections of, um, of what I've seen in my practice in Assiniboia. So the first uh, thing that I reflected on was that rural nursing is a different kind of nursing because that person in room 102 with the fractured hip, that could be my friend's aunt. And the gentleman in 108 with um, COPD and CHF, you know what? That's, uh, he plays cards with my dad down at the seniors club. So there is, there, there's a different sense of, of responsibility to these patients because they're people that we know and love. And that was, um, anyone that works in rural can appreciate that. So, um, you know, part of this common sense approach to me, it was about using nursing expertise and caring and combining it with the art and science just as as Curtis presented, what's the science behind this? Paul, um, Brian presented a number of statistics there too. What is the science behind this? What is the evidence? And, and the evidence is clear. So um, that was um, I, one of the quotes that really hit home to me once I got involved in this was from uh, Shelley Valere. I hope I'm saying her name right, uh, from Alberta Health Services. And, the, and her quote was, when we really care, when we really care about the patient experience and their outcomes, and we're willing to put that first in front of everything else, good things happen. And that's what rural nursing is about. So my second reflection, um, and this was something, it, it, this is going to sound so simple, and it's, it, it is, it's that seniors like to be warm. And if there's one thing I have seen um, at the Assiniboia Union is that when we have our seniors dressed, they are much less likely to climb back into bed and pull the covers up because they're cold. So when they get to wear a sweater over top of their clothing and they're layered up and all of you know what I'm talking about, um, they just tend to stay out of bed. And it, it, you know, it makes it much easier. So something just as very simple as that. Um, the third thing that I reflected on was about patient dignity. And I spoke a little bit about that, our residents, our patients wanting to go down and sit with the residents in long-term care, but they didn't want to be in pajamas when everyone else was dressed. 
and um, just the dignity of that. The other thing, our facility has an outdoor healing garden. And it, again, um, how many people do you see outside in their pajamas? Not many, and especially not our seniors. It's, a, it's about their dignity. So if we were trying to encourage a family member, a loved one to take that patient outside, they were, they're really not willing to do that unless they're dressed. So if we have them dressed throughout the day, they're much more likely to enjoy that, that space. And as Curtis said, it's, it, it's giving that opportunity to move. It's, it's something intentional. So you know what? We should go outside. We should water those plants in the garden. We should sit in the gazebo. Let's get some sun. Let's get some vitamin D. So um, that is something we definitely see in Assiniboia is we ver we ver you very rarely will find someone in their pajamas out in the healing garden. The uh, fourth thing that I, I spoke about was about the comments that I've had from family members. And the one that sticks out the most for me was a, um, a post-op hip, a post-op fractured hip patient, a gentleman who had been from our community. We had sent him out to the city because of course we don't do those surgeries in Cinnaboya. So he'd been sent out to the city to an orthopedic surgeon. He'd had a very long and protracted recovery. He'd been out in the city for almost a month before he actually got back, uh, was repatriated to our facility to continue his rehab. And the very first day that I looked after him and said, would you like to get dressed? Um, he looked at me and he said, I haven't worn my own clothes for a month. And I thought to myself, wow, how, how must that feel to not be able to be who you are? Our clothing is who we are. And so that really touched me. And so we said to his daughter, who, is, who had come in that evening, we said, you know, would, would you like to bring your dad some clothes? And uh, she was quite surprised, but she said, yeah, yeah, she would do that. So the next day when she arrived and her dad was up in his room in his clothing, she, um, she came out of the room and she was quite teary. And she said to me, you have no idea what a boost you've given my dad. She said, he just looks better. He's smiling. He's so happy to be wearing his favorite cardigan. And I, I thought about what she said and the nonverbal communication that was there, those tears in her eyes, that smile on her face. Not only did we give her, a give her dad a boost, we gave her a boost that there was the potential that her dad was going to get home. And I don't think we can uh, take for granted the impact of conversations like that. And so something as simple as seeing her dad in his favorite sweater, his favorite cardigan, and it, it just made, it, it gave her a sense of hope. And, and I think that's really important and, and something that, that I, um, I, a precious memory that I'll, that I'll hold. So I talked about a little bit about our tickle trunk. Um, our tickle trunk even has clothing. I, I love telling this story. We have a special care aide who is an amazing seamstress. So even a lot of our patients that come back and maybe are um, have fractured hips and cannot be mobile, so they're on six weeks non-weight bearing, but we still get them up. We get them up into chairs. We actually have um, altered clothing where um, you know, it's easy to put on and nobody knows that the back is actually open and that there's ties back there and that the pants actually are open so that when we get them up into the lift, it's easy to change them and things. So uh, we have this whole whack of um, clothing that our own special care aid has altered for our patients like that. And even for our palliative patients, it's nice for their families to see them wearing a favorite sweater or a top that we can just put on them and it isn't pajamas and it isn't blue because let's face it, not all, of, not all of us look so bright in blue. So um, it, it is, it is uh, I, I'm quite proud of our tickle trunk and I was really pleased to hear Curtis say that when from our conversations that that's something they've started in, in Swift Current. Um, so Curtis talked a little bit about when you see other people up and I call it that, that peer pressure effect. So when the other uh, patients in our hospital are, are, they see them up in the halls dressed, 
uh, you know, it, it, it does, you know, there, there's something there that our patients say, oh, well, I see everyone else is doing it. So, so I'll get up and get moving. And then um, I do want to acknowledge that um, it does take extra time. There is abs, I will, I, I absolutely, I totally agree. It does take extra time to get a person fully dressed in the morning to maybe help them with toileting when they're fully dressed. Now they've got to go for a chest x-ray. So you've got to get them out of those clothes and into a gown. I, I totally get that. And we're very lucky that we have, um, you know, where I work, uh, really good uh, nurse to patient ratios that we're able to provide take that extra time and provide that extra care of getting dressed. But I think we cannot dismiss the opportunity that it presents itself when you're seeing and helping someone get dressed. So as a nurse, the perfect opportunity to assess their activities of daily living. How easy is it for them to put on their shoes? How easy is it for them to do buttons? And now while I'm helping them, great time to do our skin assessments, great time to get your stethoscope out and listen to chest sounds and bowel sounds. And so you just take those opportunities and it just becomes part of how you do your nursing work. Um, the other thing that, uh, the other little story I told is that it's a great way to also access, act, act, sorry, assess some subtle cognitive impairments. So I remember a gentleman who I said, um, can I help you get dressed? And he said, oh no, I can do it. And then he came out of the room and he was wearing the incontinent pad on the outside of his pants. And I commented about it and he, you know, I said, oh, what, what, what's with that? And he said, oh, well, you know, isn't that where it goes? Okay. So he'd been hiding quite well that there was some subtle cognitive changes going on. And it was just watching him do his activities of daily living, getting dressed, that actually then for the nursing staff, we were able to say to his family, we can see why there's some problems at home because here's what we're seeing in hospital. That's something we wouldn't have noticed if he hadn't been getting dressed. So um, we do only have about eight minutes left and I do wanna give some time for questions. Um, so again, uh, Curtis and Paul gave you some Twitter handles to follow. Uh, some Facebook pages to follow if you're interested in NPJ paralysis. I know the Saskatchewan Association of Licensed Practical Nurses actually at their last AGM had a speaker from NPJ paralysis and that the LPN Association is getting involved in that. Um, Alberta Health Services is very involved and I will be pleased when uh, we have a real concerted effort from Saskatchewan Health Authority to really promote this. Uh, Curtis has just put his um, email and his Twitter handle up for you, and I, I will vouch for it if you want those posters. Um, I got them laminated. They're up in all our rooms. It's a great way at admission to say, oh, by the way, in our facility, we would like you to have clothing, but if you don't, we can provide you some, but every morning we prepare them, right? Every morning, your nurse is going to come in and ask you if you need help getting dressed. And we would prefer if you were only in your pajamas um, at bedtime. So, okay. So, Terry, I will turn it over to you then. That is my part of it. It was an absolute pleasure to do this uh, with Brian and Curtis. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing the virtual summit. And you can go, as, as uh, Brian said, you can go online and look at all those sessions it was amazing to me the amount of presenters and the the um there was everything from pediatric icu how they get ventilated uh patients up and moving on you know using the little tykes cars that they push down the hallway for their pediatric patients everything to the geriatric population it's applicable across the ages so if you have a chance uh go through and and take a look at some of those sessions so Thank you very much, SRNA, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present today. And uh, on behalf of my colleagues, thank you very much. And if there's any questions, we'll be happy to take those. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Joanne and Curtis. Wonderful information and such a, an important thing. I worked a lot in pediatrics, and that was something that we, we did with the kids, um, was make sure that they got dressed so that they could feel like kids and not just be in that bed um, feeling sick or 
uh, you know, gives them some more energy. So I really, I think this is a great thing. Um, just waiting for questions to come through, but I do have one. So as a, you know, RNs are leaders in the, in the healthcare system, how would you, like, is there one tip that you would give to a nurse who's maybe going to watch this video or this webinar recording later on? One tip for how they could bring this to their workplace. Sure. So, um, so again, in Assiniboia, we were already doing this. We weren't doing it under the auspice of NPJ paralysis. So there was more we could do, and that was reaching out. So I reached out to Curtis and said, could I get those posters to put up? Talk to my nurse manager and said, no, we're already doing this, but we, we, do need to, we do need to promote this, and we should also be very proud that we're doing it. So we got those posters up. Um, our new staff coming in, we, um, you know, they're, they were the sort of same as me as when I started down there five years ago. Oh, really? We get our patients dressed in the morning? Yep, we sure do. So sometimes it's just one person taking the initiative. There is lots of evidence behind this. And I think that that is the key that you can use to say, I think we should start this on our ward. And if you're going to do that, you also have to be willing to lead it. So you have to be the one that reaches out to Curtis and gets the posters and gets the research and says, hey, at a staff meeting, let's listen to this webinar that SRNA presented. And guess what? You're going to have LPNs that are going to say, oh, I heard about that at our AGM. And you get it, the ball rolling, but you, someone has to take the initiative. And I would encourage those registered nurses to do it. One of, I'm, I'm going to add a little bit, Terry, to that. Um, Could I, I have, I'll, I just have something too, and to say like with, when we're talking about mobility, I think it's it's uh, yeah, definitely a, you want somebody to take the initiative and take that to lead it. But I think when we're talking about mobility, I think it's it's everybody's role. I think it's everybody from the the RN, the LPN, the CCAs, the therapists, the physicians. I mean, physicians can be writing this stuff in the in the orders. Um, a, a physicians can round with their patients if they want as they walk down the hall. Um, I think the if we we all have a role in getting people to move and and i think when we when we take it as as uh when we try to take the um it you know as being say a therapist led initiative or a, a nursing led initiative i think we're doing you know the more people that can get do this with the patients the better the the because you know we can only spend so much time with each patient and the more of us that can get involved, I think is, is, is better. Um, if that, if that makes sense, I think it's every, it's everybody's role to move people. That is, that is a great point, Curtis. And so mm -hmm. to answer Terry's question for, for a nurse that's interested in this, get an ally, right? Get an ally, get a physiotherapist, get a doc who's like, Oh yeah, I believe in that. We got to prevent deconditioning. Let's, you know, let's move this. So definitely, Interestingly enough, during the uh, Virtual Global Summit, one of the Alberta presenters um, who presented their statistics in their facility, one of the questions I asked was around, when you are bringing nursing students in to, uh, or physiotherapy students, any type of um, health professional student, are they aware of this initiative? Are they hearing about it in school? And where do we need to go, like, you know, back and get this ingrained into education and unfortunately from what I heard in those facilities in Alberta is that the nursing students had never heard of this the first time they heard about it was when they were working on that particular ward that had an initiative like this so something that we need to start thinking about there's maybe a faculty member that says hey this is something that we can you know get started on a uh, great great project for a student to say I'm going to go on to a ward and this is you know going to be you know something that I'm you know I might lead maybe a, a fourth year student I know the fourth year nursing students that I'm uh, precept in Assiniboia were just wow we've never we've never heard of this and, well here you go you're going to start it and you know they're going to go off and work in different facilities so you know it starts to it starts to make waves elsewhere yep great Curtis did, was there anything else that you'd like to wrap up with no, I, I think the one thing I just got to mention, I think probably too, in terms of the projects and NPJ paralysis is from, from all ends of it, we've always had it as, and, and I think the, um, 
from Brian's end as well, it's been an optional thing. So it's it's something we encourage. We we say it's important. We give them, but it but it's something that's optional. I think some even from the staff end, the barrier uh, that they say, well, if somebody you know is incontinent of bowel and they're and it, you know can't, it, we're not we're not going to try and put somebody's Wrangler jeans on them, right? It's, it's not, that's, that's not the case. It's, we're, it's all optional. We use our judgment and our common sense and um, you know, it is encouraged, but we know those patients like Joanne had mentioned, you know, there are certain people, you know, like, Hey, this person would really probably benefit from having their own clothes and, and, and that, and it, there are uh, definitely certain people that it works better with, but it definitely from our end was totally optional from Brian's in, in the UK. It was always an option project not necessarily ran as something like I did like a quality improvement it was just just kind of flowed um, yeah, so great Excellent. well thank, thank you. you thank you both it was a great hour spent and wish you both well with continuing this uh, initiative and uh, to anybody who's watching this have the courage to bring this to your workplace because it's a great a great way to keep people moving and and reduce the impact of um, hospitalization. So, mm -hmm. everybody, have a wonderful day.